Welcome to this edition of the Critical Border Studies Speaker Series. Um, it's a pleasure to have uh, this year's uh, co-director presenting uh, today, Tristan Stern, which I think a lot of you know. Uh, Tristan is an assistant professor of geography here at York University, uh, has recently co-edited uh, uh, the book Mapping the End, uh, the End Times, American Evangelical Geopolitics and Apocalyptic Visions, and has his own book under contract and coming out sometime in several years. In several years. <laughs> uh, with a catchy title, The Future is a Foreign Country, Apocalypse and the Geopolitical Imagination in Israel and Palestine. And he's published uh, several articles and book chapters on um, political geography, religious uh, geopolitics, and environmental geopolitics, mainly. And um, today, uh, Tristan's talks is uh, titled, Guts Just War, American Christian Zionist Landscape Pilgrimage, and the Justification for Palestinian Dispossession. It's definitely too long. Always. OK, uh, thanks for the introduction, buddy. Sit. Sit. Sit Thanks for coming. Um, again, many of you are familiar faces. Uh, so today, you know, I'm just going to be talking about how Christian Zionists uh, imagine the geopolitics of the Gaza War, the 08-09 Gaza War that happened over Christmas and into the first month into January of 2009, also called Operation Cast Lead or the Gaza Massacre, it's often called. Um, and so it's true, it is a book chapter from my dissertation, um, and it's under contract with the University of California Press, which they're notoriously slow, that's why I said two years at least, they're very slow. And I'm not even finished it yet, so uh, hopefully this summer. And then, then they can take their sweet time publishing it. Um, <clears throat> so what I'll talk about today, first, um, just many of you are familiar with critical geopolitics and what it has to do with critical border studies. And as mentioned by David, I'll embed uh, the chapter in this wider uh, discussion of uh, the title, The Future is a Foreign Country. And then obviously, who are Christian Zionists, right? We're not all familiar with what they believe and who they are. And then I'll talk about theories of landscape and also the future, um, which are crucial, um, I think, for understanding pilgrimage to Israel and Palestine, um, and uh, also the future imagination, so they're very future-oriented. And then I'll get to the, the meat of it, the empirical section, the battlefield tourism of Operation Cast Lead, how these pilgrims went to watch the war on a daily basis from uh, just beside the Press Hill. Um, and as many of you know, it's about 840 meters to Gaza City, so you could watch the whole war uh, take place in the bombing. So I went with them on many occasions. Um, and then I'll talk about four different forms of terra nullius, that is uh, the legal understanding of an empty land. Even though people live there, why can they justify taking land away from individuals? And four ways that Christian Zion has performed this type of terra nullius. So this research contributes to political geography generally um, in the Israel-Palestine conflict, um, but it's been conventionally studied uh, through elite or governmental um, and uh, academic geopolitics, so military interventions and things like that. And I'm more interested in popular geopolitics, so the cultures, how cultures have geop geopolitical visions and imaginations, um, specifically these religious actors, these Christian Zionists. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, what role have they played, how have they created their own geopolitics, and how do these play out on the ground? Um, and, you know, geopolitics is inherently a border question. I feel compelled to make this clear because it is a critical border studies um, uh, series of lectures. You know, it's about us and them, where they belong, where we belong, um, you know, what they believe, we believe, and the bordering practices that separate uh, those different interests, preferences, ethnicities, religions, language, etc. And it's also a question of nationalism and nationalism's territorial subjectivity. Um, I make, uh, I'll make the argument in the next section, anyway, about how um, these Christian Zionists have a particular religious nationalism uh, towards Israel, uh, diasporic religious nationalism, which is funny because they can never become citizens of Israel, and they can't you know, ever become ethnic or religious Jews, but yet have this very strong nationalism that supersedes their American nationalism. And so, um, I guess one more point is that you know, this presentation is on the border between Israel and Palestine, um, and how Christian Zionists witnessed the 08-09 war from the landscape lookup. So you can see State Road, which is the town we're talking about most today. It's right here. It's very small. I'm sorry. 
Um, and then the landscape lookup is right on the border here. Um, this is where the press hill was during the war, and then about 200 meters from that on another landscape. Lookout is where most Christian Zionists went to watch the war in Gaza City here, and as I said, that's about 840 meters, so it's less, less than a kilometer. Um, and it's quite clear. So, uh, to give you another, well, actually, sorry, I missed a slide. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, so the future is a foreign country. This is an obvious inversion of the famous book by David Lowenthal, The Past is a Foreign Country. Um, and David Lowenthal argues that we're selective about the past that we pick up to bring a kind of continuity to the present. But I argue that the future is equally important. It's equally fully formed and fully flawed and selective about the way we try to bring continuity to the future as well. Um, and it takes on a second meaning as well, the future is a foreign country. Um, that these Christian Zionists are future-oriented. Their national allegiance, as I said, is squarely aimed forward to an emerging kingdom of God, they believe, that's taking place in Israel. Right? Um, and, and rather than America, so America is imagined to fall in a kind of moral decline, and Israel is in a moral ascendancy. <clears throat> and so they believe basically three things. We're on the third section now. Um, you know, this is an interesting painting. It's a huge painting. It's about this high. Um, in someone, a Christian Zionist home. And as you can see, it's Jesus blessing Jews at the Kotel, at the Wailing Wall, which, as you can imagine, would be pretty offensive for a lot of people. Um, but anyway, uh, this is the kind of idea that they, you know, Jesus is guiding over Israel and orchestrating the wars and orchestrating Armageddon. Um, so they believe, one, that Armageddon will converge on Israel, and it's imminent, it's very soon, and that Jews, not Christians, are the chosen people of earth. This is important. So Christians are the chosen people of heaven, Jews are the chosen people of earth, and therefore they're venerated, venerated um, um, as such. Um, and then lastly, the creation of Israel in 1948 um, was considered the most important fulfillment of prophecy to take place since the resurrection of Christ. <clears throat> so Christian Zionists, as I said before, are the kind of diasporic religious nationalism. Now, you might say, well, how is a religious nationalism possible? Um, well, uh, it's, it's you know, one of the only ones, I would say, where their religion is uh, completely fulfills or, or um, uh, determines the possibility of a nationalism. Um, where it's, you know, their reading of the Bible says that they have to have this allegiance to this state, this emerging state of Israel, um, and, and that's why they have a nationalism for that. So it's probably impossible and sustained by the religion where religion can be practiced in the name of the nation, and nationalist politics can be in the name of God itself. So they believe Israel really foreign policy is then performed by God. And if it's performed by God and infallible then, then any criticism of it is also criticizing God. So every time America, let's say, criticizes some kind of Israeli foreign policy or something that happens, um, they, 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 they're then critical of, of America, not Israel. So it's very rare that anything Israel does they're critical of. Um, and many of you have probably read in newspapers of natural disasters like Katrina or something like, um, yeah, well, Katrina's a good example. It was blamed um, for George Bush's roadmap, right? The process of George Bush's roadmap was then God's wrath in America, disciplining them, um, you know, for, for, these, for these actions. Um, and uh, there was a Pew poll released recently that said that 42% of American Christians saw themselves as Christian first and American second, right? Uh, so they privilege this religious nationalism over their ethnic or civic nationalism, uh, which allows for the transposition of these national identities. I don't know if I had another slide here. Right, okay, so here you can see you know, a group of Christian Zionists waving an Israeli flag at, uh, this is Armageddon actually, it's an actual place. Um, this in, in Israel, uh, it's Tel Megiddo, uh, waving an, Amer uh, an Israeli flag, not an American flag. So, who are they? Well, um, there's many expatriates living there on, you know, two, three-year visas. Um, some have made Aliyah, claiming that they have a Jewish background. There's about a thousand of them living there permanently. But for the most part, the people I'm studying are pilgrims. Um, so about 100,000 American Christian Zionists enter Israel and Palestine every year as pilgrims. It's a huge number. It's a lot of people. And as such, it, re it you know, reforms the landscapes. Um, it changes uh, the politics and the economy of the state as a kind of boosterism. And, you know, they're predominantly white, predominantly married, predominantly middle-aged, um, you know, lower to middle class. They're often Pentecostals or non-denominational evangelicals. And, you know, they're not, usually they're from the American South, but they're often from suburban areas like, um, 
uh, like Orange County uh, or just outside of Seattle or Portland and Chicago. They're you know, spread out all throughout the United States. So it's not something that's just endemic to the American South. Um, this is a map actually from a Christian Zionist text which shows the territorial maximalism uh, required uh, before Jesus will return. Um, and so this means that, you know, uh, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, large parts of Iraq, um, parts of Egypt need to come under Israel's umbrella in order for Jesus to return. And so this is the objective, right? Uh, the objective is to take the West Bank and Gaza, incorporate it within larger Israel, expel the Palestinians, and, um, or, or, or kill them, one of the two, uh, in order for Jesus to return. This is all then thought of as this larger practice or larger process of creating um, Yeshua's return, which they, they use the Hebrew term, because often their rites and rituals have been changed to more Jewish ones. So instead of the Sunday Sabbath, they have a Saturday Sabbath. Instead of saying Jesus, they say Yeshua now. Um, these sorts of things. <clears throat> um, and so, uh, you know, it has to be expanded to the River Euphrates, down to the River Nile, over to the Mediterranean, um, before uh, the Third Temple can be built and Jesus can take up his throne there. And so, in many ways, they're picking up on, you know, this famous quote from David Ben-Gurion, that Jews have a sacrosanct tithe deed to Palestine with genealogy for over 3,500 years. They have this kind of irredenta rights logic that's biblically um, infallible, and they, you know, absolutely have a right to Gaza and the West Bank. And Palestinians and Gaza are then just these persistent interlopers. And... You know, this is interesting in Beck's explanation, for in part because it disrupts these expectations of ethno-national religious correspondence. You know, America, evangelical American, and has an unexpected convergent expression of religious territoriality. Thus contributing to theoretical observations that identities are often multiple and competing. <clears throat> so why should we study them? Um, Stuart Croft, who's a political scientist of the Christian right, uh, argues that they have their own foreign policy that challenges Marxist, liberal, and realist perspectives, what he calls an evangelical foreign policy. And of the around 30 million um, American Christian Zionists, the New York Times says that they have about $200 million, sorry, no worries, $200 million a year uh, to illegal settlement activity, um, funneling money through all sorts of institutions. Um, and in uh, 2009 alone, John Hagee, um, who became famous in, in 2007 uh, for the general population, um, uh, contributed $59 million to settlement activity. And uh, uh, in that year alone, uh, through his megachurch. <clears throat> and he now has, he now has a sports arena named after him in the Jewish settlement, or the, sorry, the West Bank settlement of Ariel. And as I said, there's about 100,000 American Christian Zionist pilgrims that come in each year. And these are the people that I was studying in these different landscape lookouts. Uh, we'd go to them and just basically listen to the things they had to say, embed the groups, um, you know, obviously tell them who I was. Um, and, um, and also, you know, lived with them for about a year and a half. And I went to church with them almost every day. We went on trips. I took college courses with them. Basically, very much embedded within the group. Um, and this is where I got a lot of my information from. But anyway, the $200 million uh, um, um, quote, um, Daniel Kurtzer, who's the uh, uh, former U.S. ambassador to Israel in the New York Times, wrote that a couple of hundred million dollars makes a major difference and a focus creates a new reality on the ground in Israel and Palestine. And that's precisely what these Christian Zionists are trying to do. They're trying to create this new reality. They're trying to basically um, take the West Bank and Gaza and pull it into the Israeli fold. <coughs> And so what are these geopolitics? Well, um, you know, I started this research in 2006. I looked at a lot of discourse analysis, and I looked at a lot, and I read a lot of the pastors and the major writers and the Christian Zionist groups. Um, and one of the biggest leaders, or at least in the 70s and 80s, was Hal Lindsey. And he wrote this famous book called The Late Great Planet Earth. And uh, if you haven't heard of it, it was the best-selling nonfiction book of the 1970s, according to the New York Times. It sold over 60 million copies. Um, it was, you know, written by a Christian Zionist about the end of the world and where it was going to take place. And he takes a particular Cold War perspective that the USSR was going to come down in these waves for Armageddon, you know, to have this uh, uh, sub or Russian amphibious assault, the, the submarines were going to come in here and, and destroy Israel. And he had it all planned out. It was going to happen in 1988. Well, that year came and left. Uh, 
And, uh, um, but nevertheless, it was a very influential book, and it was in a, written in a particular time where people conf were confused about their histories, about what was going on in the world. And it made sense to a lot of people, and it was quite influential. Um, but, you know, of course, after the Cold War, uh, it had to be re-territorialized and re-transposed. So the Gog and Magog, who were once Russia, now became Iraq and Iran, and the Arab world generally became this new evil. Saddam Hussein was uh, the center, um, and so they drew these new maps, and they had these new ideas about the geopolitics of Armageddon and where it was going to come from. You know, these were going to be the Arab forces. You know, in the 40s and 50s, it was the Chinese, it was the yellow, uh, you know, it was this uh, yellow tide that was going to come in, they called it, um, and that was going to cross the Middle East and into Israel and Palestine. Um, so it's always being retransposed, it's being re-territorialized constantly. But I wanted to ask, instead of this sort of bird's eye down, looking at just the pastors, looking at just the famous writers, but how do these everyday Christian Zionists uh, practice their geopolitics? You know, what differences do they, do they have to the major leaders? How does these geopolitics play out on the ground? So I used ethnographic criticism observations, as I said, living with them for 1.5 years. And it became, as I, you know, as I um, embedded myself, it became clear to me that I was actually studying landscapes. Uh, that Christian Zionists, like most Protestants, are quite critical of houses of worship. Um, they see them as idols, uh, partly because they don't have any control over them. The Catholics and the Orthodox Christians have most of the control over the places that Jesus may have walked or prayed. Um, and so they've turned to landscapes where they can have this abstract view and they can define it the way they want. Um, even the places that they do hold, um, like the uh, garden tomb, which they believe is actually where Jesus was laid to rest and is was risen, not the whole Church of Holy Sepulcher, is this garden landscape. Um, there's no buildings, it's just open place. Um, so they're very much interested in having the ability to have this abstract generality on places from afar, but, you know, as opposed to idolizing a particular building. But as we know from W.J.T. Mitchell, landscapes are also idols, they're also these vessels of nationalism. And he writes especially about this, you know, the Israeli uh, landscapes as uh, masking ideology and naturalizing power. And as what we know from Stephen Daniels as well, they help us to picture the nation. We see the strength, the beauty, the history, and also crucially the future of the nation through landscapes. We are able to imagine them without being encumbered by the complexities that are down below uh, in the landscapes themselves. And so there's a performed authenticity to the landscape's materiality that validates biblical events through these witnessing of places. And therefore, to define these landscapes is also to define the truth. And so, the problem with Gaza, however, is that it's not really a religious site. It's only mentioned in passing in the Old Testament, um, but it's been transformed into this sacred site as a holdout for this prophetic fulfillment of territorial maximalism. And it's become a hollowed out space uh, for Israeli Jews as they are seen to being on the front lines of an apocalyptic war. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so, uh, just to, to switch from you know just landscapes to future theory um, and how landscapes are help us imagine the future or help Christian Zionists imagine the future, um, they become productive of logics of enchantment of space and influence preemptive political actions, especially in the case where knowledge is assumed to be predetermined and infallible, and it allows for you know preemption as well. And so, oh, okay, sorry. These were the other two landscapes that I studied, the two other major chapters. This is the Tel Megiddo, or Armageddon, this is the Jezreel Valley, um, where apparently more wars have been fought than any other place, and this is the place mentioned in the Bible, uh, where it's thought that the final war was you know, the armies of, of evil versus the armies of good were going to line up and have their giant battle. That was one landscape. And then the other one was here, the Mount of Olives, which is a terrible picture. I took it on my phone. Um, but the, you know, the, the Haram al-Sharif, or the Temple Mount, whatever you want to call it, um, this is where the third temple is either going to fall out of the sky or be rebuilt, and Jesus is going to take up his throne. Um, and so they tend to go to places like, you know, um, uh, the third temple museum or the temple museum um, inside the old city, and uh, kind of pray or practice this redef redefinition of the landscape as being the center, the sacred center of, um, of, of uh, not just Jerusalem, but the world. And so, um, in terms of futures, um, I look at what Barbara Adams calls the memories of the future. Um, it's an interesting engagement. It calls attention to how they're not just attempting to recover the past in a kind of conservatism, but they're also squarely looking at the anticipation and expectation of a new kingdom of God on earth. Um, and so how can we have memories of the future, you know, um, um, if they haven't yet happened? 
Well, futures are still these knowledge practices. We remember different pieces of information, right? Um, and as the historian and anthropologist Daniel Rosenberg and Susan Harding put it, the future is not an empty category. Even as we accept a skeptical critique of prophecy, we must accept that the future is not underdetermined as overdetermined. Our futures are junkyards of memories we've not yet had. The idea here is that the future is really full. It's flawed, just like we are ideas of the past. But we all have a kind of trajectory. We know, we think we know where we're going. We have a vague idea of what our future lies in, in front of us. And Christian Zionists have a very certain perspective on the future, where they know what's going to happen. Armageddon is imminent. Jesus is going to return any time. You know, um, and uh, you know, we've had our, our series of date setters who've uh, predicted when that's going to happen. Um, and so what I would argue for geography or for border studies is that this is also spatialized, you know, so through landscape, through borders, through states. Um, the future is taken on a kind of um, uh, materialization where memorable events are, have happened or are going to happen. But how do we understand the difference between memories of the future versus memories of the past? Well, the phenomenologist um, Alfred Schultz suggested that the past is understood as because, and the future is understood as in order to. That is, the, 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 the former, the because, the past, takes on a naturalized cast as something that happened and it can be explained. Well, the future has a motivating quality. It's performed in order to achieve some imagined goal, right? of chasing some preconceived anticipation, did you? Um, <clears throat> uh, anticipated reality uh, that's preemptive and it motivates uh, geopolitical realities in the present. Okay, so let's see here. Right, um, just, this is just to give you perspective. You know, this is the radius of different types of rockets that can come out of Gaza. Um, but the state road in Gaza City is about um, uh, five kilometers, and then if you're right up against the border here, it's as little as a kilometer uh, away, which is where the, most of the war was watched. So to move to my empirical research, um, I went to this landscape lookout with three different organizations. Uh, what happened? <laughs> you're all right. Okay. Come here, sit. Yeah. All of this is being recorded and will be posted. Sit, That's sit. Okay. <laughs> sit, 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 sit all the time. <laughs> uh, don't leave. Okay, so um, there's three different organizations I went on trips with. Um, two congregations, one's Shimon Sasan and then the larger King of Kings, um, both uh, in Jerusalem and, and both of the largest uh, congregations of Christian Zionists in Jerusalem. And then uh, one organization called the International Christian Embassy in Jerusalem, which is the largest institution lobbying for Christian Zionist interests in Israel. Um, and they have a, a, a conference every year called the Feast of Kent Tabernacles in October. And it's the largest non-Jewish conference in uh, all of Israel every year. And it's addressed by the Prime Minister um, um, every year as well. So I have a picture of it here, Ariel Sharon addressing it. Uh, there he is. Um, at the Tabernacles Camp Conference in 2005. Uh, so it's you know, quite popular, um, it's quite influential, it brings a lot of money into the state. <clears throat> and they always do these trips every year, and this was around the time when Kassam rockets were starting to rise again, um, and, and they were starting to hit State Road more regularly, um, uh, because as the uh, ceasefire tried it was disintegrating at, the, at that time. Um, and so, between, so before the war, I went three times with different groups, and then um, during the war, I went four times between December 27, 2008 and the 17th of January 2009. During the war, as many of you know, anywhere between 1,200 and 1,400 uh, Palestinians were killed, and about 13 Israelis uh, died, four from friendly fire. Um, right, here's a times 10 picture of bombings from that particular landscape lookout. Um, and uh, normally it would just look like a bunch of clouds, but you can, it gives you a perspective of how close you can actually feel. Um, and, and really the arresting part of this isn't just the visuals, you can feel the bombs when, they, when they're dropped, and the sound waves come through your body and it's rather definite, you can feel it's arresting. Um, so I couldn't imagine being that close to anything like that. So um, you, took, you took this picture? Yeah, I took, most of my pictures are really bad because I took them with cell phones. <coughs> but, um, most of them just look like this. I mean, I'm not a terrible photographer, that's okay, right? No, no, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't about the quality, it was about okay. being uh, okay. very close to an exploding 
But oh, I'm not that close. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, it, as I said, from where I looked, if naked eye, it just looked like smoke. Okay. Yeah, but you have to have a lens on your camera. Okay. Uh, it would normally look like, shit. Maybe, maybe. Oh, it looked like this. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it would normally oh, still, look like yeah. You can see the smoke here. Yeah, um, okay. I'm, no, I'm uh, not as concerned as I was. <laughs> Get down, Tristan. Forms you have to fill out your. You're going to be doing research like Dr. Bond. I never told DCLA at the time. Uh, but, uh, um, so, uh, so at the conclusion of most of these trips, we'd go to this landscape lookout, um, which is at the edge of the border, close to Gaza City. Um, and you know, these Christian Zionists would perform themselves as being embattled. Uh, with Jewish Israelis and the bombing of Gaza, right? So um, they often took, um, uh, they saw you know, them as victims of a racialized evil, that you know, Muslims, which is often what they would call them, um, were at, uh, you know, at Israel's doorstep, the evil was marching forward. And since um, the settlement withdrawal of Gush Katif in 2005, um, a lot of these settlers were moved and put in like really uh, tent towns and, other, and moved to other areas, and were also bar bombarded by uh, Qassam rockets at various times. Um, they um, would often visit these, what they call refugees, um, <clears throat> and increasingly common pilgrimage sites, and personally, they thought they were doing God's work, right, and assisting the elderly, listening to settler stories, and most importantly, donating substantial sums of money to their resettlement, and also in the hopes that they could move back into Gush Katif and resettle uh, Gaza. That was the, the, end, the end point. Um, Stereo became a site for American support, not just Christian Zionists as well, I mean, many of you have probably heard of this town, um, and even Barack Obama decided to visit there when he went to Israel early in his first term. So we see uh, Barack, uh, the former mayor uh, of Stay Road, uh, holding up an I Love Stay Road t-shirt with a Kassam rocket going through the heart. Um, and this was taken in July 2008, uh, or July 23rd, 2008. So Christian Zionist pilgrims framed Israel's 2008-2009 invasion of Gaza in a manner that reinforced their own prophetic identities. And as I said before, we're, today we're going to talk about Terra Nullius. Um, so I'm finally done with the theory and we can get down to business. Um, and so rather than, you know, as I, as I said, I wanted to, you know, uh, do this sort of discursive discourse analysis of both uh, on high, those people who are the big writers and the big um, uh, pastors for Christian Zionists, but also I wanted to embed myself within Christian Zionists going to watch the war um, on a regular occasion while it was going on. Um, and so for each one of these examples of Terra Nullius, uh, I'll give two examples. I'll give one um, that's kind of uh, by a pastor or a writer in the Christian Zionist community, and then another quote from um, the, the actual uh, empirical work that I did with them. So the first is denying the Palestinians' ability to reason, or that they have humanity, and these are all attempting to deny them any kind of sovereignty, territorial rights, or nationalism. Uh, by denying Palestinians existed or exist as a legitimate national identity, by claiming Palestinians cannot rule or feed themselves or change the land, and four, by claiming that Israel's expansion into Gaza was prophetically inevitable and therefore justing, justifying a God, the Gaza war as a just war, as God's war. <clears throat> and right, so, you know, th this isn't to say that, you know, anybody, you know, watching the war from the landscape is going to have a kind of empathy for Gazans. And that, that was actually reasonably common. Uh, where people would say, oh, you know, uh, poor Gazans, uh, we feel bad for them. But inevitably, they would always revert to this by saying, well, it's inevitable. This is part of Armageddon. This is part of the times that we're living in. Um, there's nothing we can really do about it. And uh, the, often the discourse was that they should just leave. They could save themselves a lot of pain. If they just left Gaza, we wouldn't have to do this, or God wouldn't have to do this. Um, and so often the discourse was that they were just Arabs, and Arabs could live in any state. This was Jewish, ethnic, religious land, and they should just leave. Um, and so, you know, that's not to say, again, that there wasn't uh, uh, empathy. Um, that, that, that went along with it. Um, so uh, the first, by denying Palestinians their ability to reason and their humanity, as many of you know, the Goldstone Report that came out of the United Nations Human Rights Council um, tried to clear the material debris of the war. Um, Richard Goldstone found that there are crimes and possibly crimes against humanity committed on both the Israeli and Palestinian sides during the war. And it found that Israelis' military assault on Gaza was a, quote, uh, deliberately disproportionate attack designed to punish, humiliate, and terrorize a civilian population 
radically diminish its local economic capacity both to work and to provide for itself and to force upon it an ever-increasing sense of dependency and vulnerability. We see several forms of terrain within this quote. We're going to focus on this part, the, the vulnerability, but we can see that you know, they, they can't feed themselves, therefore you know, Palestinians don't have the capacity to feed themselves, that um, you know, the, the inversion of this one humiliate and terrorize the civilian population. Uh, for Christian Zionists, it's the opposite. It's the Palestinians who are humiliating and terrorizing um, uh, uh, the Israeli population. Um, and so you know, we see several forms. We're going to focus on the humanity, the vulnerability element here. In contrast, uh, then President Shimon Peres responded to the report saying, I quote, it makes a mockery of history and that it does not distinguish between the aggressor and the defender. <clears throat> Again, he's trying to reverse this. Uh, Christian Zionists echoed Israeli top brass by saying, I quote, rewarding terror, demonizing Israel, and seeking to constrain Israel's capacity to protect itself. The point is this, this counter-argument, right? That, that Israelis are the victim, Israelis scripting themselves as the victims, and Palestinians are imagined as counter-distinctions, ruthless and inhuman aggressors. And such a def definition of savage inhumanity delegitimizes any Palestinian claim to reason by the Lockean definition of Terran Elias. And following Grotius, Locke argued that without humanity and reasonable limits on violence, claim to land is denied on the basis that the population has an animal nature. Right. So this is um, that 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 uh, Israelis are victims and vulnerable. Um, the aggressors are the Palestinians, and they're of an animal nature. Um, so during the October 2008 Feast of Tabernacles conference that I attended, there were three coach buses. Um, uh, one of, in one of which I, I was in, um, and we went to uh, Stay Road. Um, in part, there was just outside, or actually just south, south of it, in the Karem Shalom uh, crossing, there was a Gilad Shalit uh, protest at the border, uh, which was cancelled because of Kassam rockets at that time. Uh, but we went to the landscape lookout for the first time, or I went there for the first time, and it was all a big fundraiser for the Operation Life Shield Bomb Shelter project which is an opportunity to, for these Christian Zionists to experience and suffer with and comfort Jews, uh, feeling like they're in an embattled uh, state or a battled town. And so uh, these are what they look like, this is a larger one, it's a bomb shelter. Uh, has anyone been in one before? Yeah? They're usually full of feces, and they, you wouldn't want to go in there, um, even if there was a bomb, I think, most times. It's pretty bad in most of them. Um, but anyway, they're you know they're they're, they're built uh, to protect uh, many people in State Road uh, from Gazelle rockets, um, <clears throat> and, the, and the hope was that Christian Zionists would donate money to build more of these things. But you know, at, at heart, for the ICEJ who put on this conference, it was about them feeling like they're suffering with them and, and helping um, the, the population. So there are common tropes of vulnerability that run through the landscape here. Um, some of the things that were said was that it was, uh, you know, State Road was small, it was a mere small town, Israel's a small state, which contributed to its vulnerability. There was often talk about Jews having a historically and presently vulnerable population, being a historically and presently vulnerable population, um, that uh, Christian Zionists were taking practical action, they were empowered by agency, bestowed, um, so, that, you know, they could reverse or mitigate violence, you know, sort of a victim-savior logic, right? The Jews are the victim, the savior are Christian Zionists. Um, and also an empowerment through the landscape as well um, to try to foresee a better nation by looking out onto the landscape. <clears throat> but before we actually went to the landscape, we watched a movie um, that was put together by the mayor at that particular time. And uh, we were shown these images evoking a pathos of victim where there's images of uh, you know, children under pr protective bar barriers or desks, helpless women and children under duress. And one picture I wasn't able to get because it wasn't on the forum, uh, but in the movie was a, a child holding a distressed puppy, um, which suggests the kind of ruthlessness or inhuman or unreasonable violence that uh, the Gazans and Pal or the Palestinians in Gaza um, have. So the ICJ, AG, ICEJ's appeal to its viewers is in direct contrast to the sympathy for any Gazans, right? They didn't care. These were just sort of objects in history. They didn't have any kind of, um, 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 uh, you know, um, agency, or they were just basically drones. They were workers of evil. Um, and so, you know, even some of the more telling signs of violence and victimhood across the border were ignored. Um, so the second by denying Palestinians existed as a legitimate, legitimate national identity. Um, Mike Huckabee, as many of you know, um, the Alabama governor and also a Christian Zionist, um, does not 
um, want to see the West Bank and Gaza to Palestinians. He's very cl clear on this as well. So when he went on a Christian Zionist tour, um, one breakfast he told a uh, rabbi at a kosher breakfast, I have to be careful saying this because people get really upset. There's really no such thing as a Palestinian. That's been a political tool to try to force land away from Israel. <clears throat> Um, so this is, you know, this sort of official point from, you know, a major figure in the Christian Zionist um, um, group, um, grouping. <coughs> so, how could be denies that there is a cohesive nationalism trying, uh, tying Palestinians together? And he's performing a form of terra nullius by denying the group that they have a right to self-definition, and then as a result, territorial rights. And even uttering the term Palestinian is considered faux pas. So, um, on one of the trips, I was uh, behind this uh, woman from Alabama, and I had mentioned the plight of people in Gaza and the political relations between what I said, Israelis and Palestinians. Um, and she turned around and said to me, Israel and what? And I repeated myself rather casually, Israel and Palestine. What would you call them? Trying to avoid confrontation. And she didn't pick up the confrontation, but what she was trying to do is discipline the larger normative discourses on the bus, right? That, you know, if you're here, it's assumed, you know, that you believe that Palestinians don't exist. These are just Arabs, and often most often equated to simply just Muslim, um, which has this, you know, it's, it's a category that's often equated to evil, right? It, it's what gives um, 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 meaning to the idea of calling Barack Obama an antichrist, right? If you can call him a Muslim, then you can call him an antichrist. Um, the, the, the two are equated uh, in a kind of racial, but also in a kind of um, e a way of, of, of expressing um, that they're workers of Satan. <clears throat> um, and so the bus acts as this faith reaffirming area where expectations and stories about Muslims in Gaza uh, continually are, are inculcated. Um, so the tour system and the infrastructure in place tend to reinforce what pilgrims expect to find and learn from the intersubjective framing of landscapes. And this runs counter to Mary Louise Pratt's contact zones thesis, where travel opens people's ideas up. Well, here it rather closes it off, generally. It's disciplined by the tour leader, who's always Israeli, and then also, um, you know, it disciplines this, the way to look at places, and also the pastor that's along with them. And it's very hierarchical, um, and it's, um, um, you're always disciplined to, um, to, to counter any of these discourses. So, as far as they're concerned, Palestinians don't exist, and therefore have no territorial right. The third, by arguing that Palestinians historically had no state upon which they improved the land, and therefore no irredent or right to sovereignty over the land today. And relatedly, they have an inability to rule themselves. So, one official commentator is Paul Charles Merkley, who is a professor emeritus of history at Carleton University in Ottawa. And whenever there's a, a war in Gaza or the West Bank, Merkley always appears on CBC or something like that. But what's never said is that he's one of the leaders of the Christian Zionist community in Canada. He's the head of the International Christian Embassy of, of Canada, um, which is the, the, the side part of the International Christian Embassy in Jerusalem. And he always takes this very hard line. I guess they pick him up in the media because he always takes um, a rather different, more extreme perspective on the wars. Um, and it's just assumed that if he's from the academy, he must be of a secular ilk, um, and he, he doesn't have any kind of bias in the media, but he's quite influential, this fellow. Um, and so during uh, an interview during the Gaza War, um, oh, actually, I'm missing quite a bit of the quotes here. Anyway, he said, um, Gaza is a lost cause and an international burden. Gaza's plight is a natural state and is brought on by Gazans themselves. And Gaza's impoverishment is not new. It's gone on for decades and decades. So Israel's blockade on resources, he is arguing, has little effect on the present living conditions of the Strip. Gazans left for their own industry cannot prosper or improve their lives through reasoned improvement of the land. Right, so um, and as an ethnographic sketch, of, just to show the same thing, um, two, I went on two pilgrimages to stay with Shimon Sasan, it's another congregation. <coughs> and... Um, I pressed one person uh, about the legitimacy of a Palestinian right to land and self-determination. An American who was living in Jerusalem, he told me that there's no two-state solution, no divided Jerusalem. If you give land, it will not give peace. It's the Muslim mentality. They hate Jews. I followed up by asking, hypothetically, what if two-state solution did not give the Palestinians East Jerusalem? And he responded, no, they are Muslims. They have proven they can't govern democratically. Furthermore, they won't stop at Judea or Samaria or Gaza or East Jerusalem. They want it all. 
Um, you know, you know, the point here is that you know Muslims can't rule themselves. Inevitably, it just leads to a dictatorial state, um, and, uh, um, and and therefore, you know, uh, shouldn't have any kind of sovereignty or self-determination. Um, so all three of these forms of tyrannies that have gone by so far, these denying reason, denying national identity, and denying state sovereignty, have demonstrated how Israel's violence, violent acts against Gaza have reproduced this discourse and justified the violence as a just war. Which leads us to the last one. Oh, um, that's what you'd be looking at. That's what we looked at um, quite consistently. Um, you can see Gaza City, you know, just the edge of it. Um, so the last, uh, Gaza's dispossession uh, is a religiously sanctioned prophetic inevitability um, and harbinger of the uh, worst wars to come as God's wrath grows and the world teeters on the apocalypse. <clears throat> so um, on Gaza and the West Bank, uh, James Einhoff, who's an Oklahoma senator um, and also a Christian Zionist, um, admittedly so, um, uh, came up with seven reasons why Israel is entitled to the land. This was in 2002. Um, and he gave this, this speech to the Senate. Um, and here at the very bottom, we can see there's a, there's a biblical right. He's talking about prophetic right to uh, the land um, that, that he perceives. And Christian Zionists largely believe that there will be no peace between Israel and Palestine, not because Christians do not want peace, but because peace is not possible within the ex ex exegetical framing of the war. As one prophecy expounder writes, I quote, the Bible says peace will come to the Middle East only when the Lord Jesus sets his feet back on earth to rule and reign, end quote. So just before we made a trip uh, to stay wrote with uh, the conference, the Feast of Tabernacles conference, we were addressed by uh, Yuli Edelman, who was then the Minister of uh, Public Diplomacy and Diaspora Affairs. He's now the Speaker of the Knesset. Um, and he addressed us um, in the conference. So remember, there's 7,000 people in this auditorium um, and he has, you know, obviously an interest in um, uh, addressing this group of people because they donate, you know, millions of dollars uh, for Jewish return, which is also another, uh, you know, to make Aliyah, because this is uh, necessary for Jesus to return. All Jews need to return to Israel. Um, and so he, he started off by saying, we Jews stand proud with a gun in one hand and a plow in the other. This is a common phrase that you hear all the time. Um, but then went on to say that the state of Israel is here not because we are colonizers or because we are expansionist people, but because of the divine promise of our forefathers. Israel is promised to us by God. Um, you know, the script, um, 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 uh, the script uh, helps, uh, you know, it overlaps with what the Christian Zionists believe, that, you know, this is inevitable, this is just God's way of doing things, and that um, there's nothing anybody can do about it. Um, it's in, infallible, um, and that the landscape would be personally plowed and colonized and made to bloom again. Um, and so on, on just the, the last trip I went on, on uh, the morning of January 18th, we heard on the radio that, uh, um, that there would be a 72-hour ceasefire um, that was, that was um, organized by Egypt, um, and which gave me opportunity to, you know, to ask um, about the ceasefire. And one uh, Christian Zionist uh, told me, one pilgrim told me, my father said it would be the last war when I was a child, and there have been five wars since. We must realize that there cannot be peace. The final war of all wars will determine this. And he's talking about Armageddon, and he's assuming that this is just the beginning of a larger set of wars that are going to happen in this landscape. <clears throat> so he then, you know, mined his, his sort of, um, these two fists together, this crashing of cars uh, to, to suggest that there was going to be this grand battle um, and that it was a just and holy war. So, in conclusion, uh, or concluding, um, so during George Bush's roadmap, uh, Elliot Abrams uh, was sent to go speak to the um, uh, Apostolic Conference or the United Pentecostal Church um, to try to convince them that their, the um, removal of the Gush Katif settlers was not going to affect their religious beliefs. He said, the Gaza Strip had no significant biblical influence, such as Joseph's tomb or Rachel's tomb, and is therefore a piece of land that can be sacrificed for the cause of peace. <clears throat> but obviously, uh, Pentecostals didn't buy this theory. Uh, the speech was uh, confronted with indignation, and all, they felt that all Israel and Palestine was sacred uh, because it played this prophetic role in this imagined geopolitical miracle of modern Jewish return uh, from Exodus. Um, so it's not just that Jerusalem became this, this herophony of, that Eliada talked about, you know, this grand central or sacred uh, place, 
Um, it's also that Gaza has recently become the most pressing, divisive, sacred issue because, because of the wars that were happening there. They could really feel that Armageddon must be taking place in this particular area. That the Gaza war was largely interpreted as inevitable and preordained by God. So Palestinians were most often denied their national identity, their ability to reason, their ability to rule themselves through practices that are reminiscent of the historical use of Terra Nellius. And Christian Zionists sought to discursively deny territorial rights to Palestinians in these ways. So the Starot's lookout um, uh, overlooking Gaza City in the 08-09 war was one set in the future and cementing a kind of certainty, an example of coming uh, or the return of Christ and Armageddon at the hands of the dispossession of Gazans and their land. But apocalyptic thought has within it this, I think, this, this other ability, this ability to think of, of the different futures. Um, and I'm thinking here of maybe Frederick Jameson, who encourages us to think of new utopian futures, um, to try to get away from um, uh, the confines or the, the bounds of repetitive thought. Um, and so the apocalypse does have this potential, this emergent potential. I think if we think of it as not transcendent, as not predetermined, but rather contingent, and rather transformative, I think there is a potential here. But the way the Christian Zionists seal off other possible futures um, is rather unfortunate. Um, this, this imminence of the future and knowing exactly where the future is going to, to go you know, is obviously a self-fulfilling prophecy at some level. So as uh, Elizabeth Groves, using Henry Bergson and Gilles Deleuze, argues, the future is open-ended and emergent. However, this does not mean that the future is completely free or completely determined. It is always constrained by power relations and limited or limited ability to imagine it on the one hand, and undecided in that it is emergent and always open to unexpected change. Um, you know, I'm done, but I just give you another example of maybe how futures uh, constrain our present uh, abilities to act politically. We can think of the precautionary principle, where there's an uncertain future and we, it you know, governs a larger set of discourses and practices. Um, um, uh, that limit us from doing other things uh, because of that uncertainty, which has potential, obviously, because it is uncertain and it is open, but there are different ways to imagine different utopias and different possibilities for the apocalypse. And so I don't want to suggest that the apocalypse is necessarily a bad thing and determines um, you know, wars and violence. I think it has potential to be used for more progressive elements as well. So that's it. Um, sorry if I talked too quickly.